Good morning. <laughs> Look at those eagles. I love that. I know, that adult there. What an attractive bird. They are stunning, stunning. Beautiful, beautiful lavender grey back in real life. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat this morning. I've got a frog, a bit croggy. <laughs> Which species is it? A bit croggy. Mm, common toad. <laughs> Hold on, a frog, I said. Well, I've gone toad. I feel like you're a bit deeper. Okay, so you're I've a got bit toady. A, okay, common toad. I was thinking more Hila, Hila Arborea. Well, that's good. European yourself. green, green tree frog. Yeah. Very attractive, small species. But anyway, no, it, it is, you're right. Anyway, I'm trying to clear it. <clears throat> there we are. But anyway, look, it's getting, it's getting, getting, let's go from amphibians <laughs> straight back to avians. Uh, those um, yeah, eagles. Oh, fantastic. Oh. Look at the youngsters now. Look at how I much know. they've changed. It's so quick, isn't it? It's amazing how they develop so fast. It amazes me every time we look into a nest like this. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful kind of shot. looking up at the adult. Are you, do you have food? Would you have me? Anything? Yeah. I'm but, a little bit peckish? Yeah. Um. But what I also <laughs> like is the fact that we're all able to watch these when they're in Sydney, Australia. And we're watching them in all but, all but live time. And uh, whilst we have a plethora of problems going on in the world, we do seem to sometimes have technology on our side. And when it comes to engaging people with wildlife, there's never been a better time in our history for that. No. I mm. mean, to get an inside like this, I mean, can you imagine that as a kid? Oh, my goodness me. I mean, you'd have been glued to the screen. Shall I start? When I were a kid. Oh, no. I when started. I were a kid, I used to look at white-bellied sea eagles in, in my book of birds, and they were really poor drawings. Yeah. I never dared dream, uh, dream that I would actually see one, let alone watch one live from my own kitchen. It's pretty good, isn't it? Hey? It is pretty good, all the way around the world as yeah. well. You know? Anyway, look, we've got a clip, we can take a little look at a clip where we can see how much they've been growing, because they started with a very, very white down coat. Look Here they are there. in daylight, look. A bit can... scruffy, a little bit scrawny, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, feathers are coming through here. Yeah. Look at that one in that, the, 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 the second bird there. It's got a massive crop. What's interesting about mm. these birds is that our eagles, golden eagles, um, white-tailed eagles, often lay two eggs. But the survival strategy is for just one of them to, to yeah. get through. The other one is a spare. I hate to say it. We call it the Cain and Abel strategy because of the biblical story about the brothers. But in this species, it's, it's quite common for both of the youngsters to survive. Um, and you can see the bird on the right there is obviously younger than the one on the left, but they don't they don't attack we, each uh, other. No. They're, they're not aggressive to one another. No, and they, also the adults feeding relatively equally by the looks of it, which you not wouldn't always no. get, would you? The adult would pr prioritise the stronger individual. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, as soon as the adult stops feeding and they feed themselves, mm. that stronger individual takes over. But yeah. I think in this, oh, well, as we've seen from looking at them this morning, they're both still going strong down there in Sydney, those white-bellied eagles. What a treat. Bird life, obviously, are providing that camera. Do check out the rest of their cameras mm. and on a rainy day yeah and they're going to be a plenty of those coming this autumn and winter looking at web cramps from across the world can be a great way to brighten the start of your day over breakfast yeah and you can look at it at www.birdlife.org.au so make sure you go and check that out and maybe you know maybe fledging anyway listen you know listen i missed last week so last week's little broadcast and you, you missed the weeks before i know we haven't been together in a little while no no you were gallivanting around I scotland gallivanting. you were working yeah i was gallivanting and you were working yeah yeah i was working really hard yeah <laughs> working hard hardly working anyway listen what, yes what i bought you a present yeah i was about to say where's my present yeah all the times i used to go away when you were a kid bringing you back presents from far-flung parts everything of the world everything you've ever dreamed of is in this tub oh my goodness me go on what's it well that's the quiz that's a quiz for you it's a quiz for me yeah it's a quiz for you right, so there's get... two types of poo in this is there there is two types of oh poo. my goodness that right okay it's tricky one of them should we go big bit... poo first let's go big poo right, start here's, off big here's the big poo right here it is Right, so this is obviously uh, the poo of a, a herbivore because I can see that it's got grass in it and it's a brown colour. Um, and also, I'm going to have a little sniff because that's what you do at your breakfast table. Well, that's what you do. Yeah, it smells <laughs> grassy, to be honest it. with you. It smells soily, like soil and earth. It's, it hasn't got an unpleasant smell in any way, <laughs> shape or form. So what we're looking at here is herbivore uh, poo. Mm. I know you've been to Scotland, yeah. so I'm thinking, you know, that this could be sheep. Um, because I'm thinking just of size. I'm going to run through a yeah. few species before I settle. Um, obviously, you, you're in the land of red deer. I mean, they are over other parts of the UK as mm -hmm. well, of course, but Scotland is famed for its deer on the hill. Um, and, um, and I'm looking at the size, the diameter of this poo like this. There's, also, there's another bit in here. Oh, is there? It, it was breaking up and oh. it was all... Oh, dear. That's it. I had to, the thing is, I picked this up really early in the trip, so I was driving around with 
Lots oh, of, oh, there it is. There's the rest of it. Look, got some other lovely little fragments of poo on the breakfast table now. It's great. <gasps> Luckily, finished with the old um, breakfast. There we are. Just show for you. <laughs> um, okay. Well, due to size and texture and smell and everything else, I'm going. Um, I'm going uh, red deer for that. Do you know what? You're good, and it hurts me a yeah, little bit. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Well, that's one nil. But then there's also. I'm going to, yeah, to stand nil. up to show. Now show this people. one is tricky. Okay. So here are some more poos. But they're quite small. If I can get them up there, there we are. Um, so these are pellets, and these have been produced by a rodent of some kind, um, because I'm uh, just trying to get them into a better position. And they're quite hard, and uh, they're brown. And again, of course, we're looking. When I say rodent, we're looking at a herbivore, of course. Oh, one small. You're dropping them. poo all over the kitchen counter. Yeah, there we are. Gotta okay. Stop doing that, Chris. Okay, so uh, looking at the size of these, they're way too big for any of our small rodent species, such as uh, mice and voles. Um, they are. As you see, rat poo is slightly larger than that and has a different consistency. Mm. The, this is filled full of vegetation. So I'm going to say that this is quite unfortunately rare poo. I'm going to go water vole poo for those. Water vole poo? Yeah. No. No? No. Okay. Is it a bat poo then? It's a bit of a trick. Oh. <laughs> what do you mean it's a bit of a trick? It's a bit of a trick. It's not necessarily a wild animal. Oh, goodness me. Hold on. That's, that's, that's not fair. You told me you've been scrounging poo out of the... I did, and I wanted to get something different that would, you know, be tricky. And then I thought, you know, I happened to come across a particular animal, um, and, um, um, and it had an abundance of poo. So I, um, I, I picked a little bit up, but it is a domestic animal. Domestic animal? What? Hamster? No, bigger. European hamster. Bigger. Chinchilla. Yes. This is chinchilla poo. It's chinchilla poo. You fraud. <laughs> you absolute fraud. Right. Uh, well, I wanted to, you know... You... We'd better move on <laughs> because uh, there's going to be some shenanigans in the kitchen. Oh, no, I'm been getting de de off. Defrauded by poo of the morning. Anyway, look, before we do move on, we're going to say that um, this will be our last broadcast for a little while. We're going to take a hiatus. Uh, Autumn Watch, BBC's Autumn Watch, is coming up at the end of this month and the beginning of next. And most Megan and I were involved. You've been doing something for that already. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about it. And uh, we start this week, actually. So uh, we've got some filming to do for that and, and various other things going on. So we thought we'd take a little bit of a hiatus from our broadcast. But that doesn't mean, of course, we're not going to be interacting. So please sign up to our YouTube channel, the South Isle Bird Club's YouTube channel and continue to uh, communicate via social media and we'll be putting posts out on those platforms and hopefully we'll be back in a few weeks time when we go yeah. dust get get autumn watch done and dusted yes yeah we'll be back because it's not you know just pausing for a little bit like we, we did this for spring watch we didn't did. we we yeah. did this for spring watch and, and frankly th there's simply not enough hours in the day <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we're busy on friday mornings as well mm. and there's nothing we can do about it yeah so um uh, you, you can switch to watching spring watch i uh, saw not spring watch so you've, missed, you've watch. missed that yeah <laughs> um, you can switch to watching autumn well, it's watch, still be on course. my player I don't it's know. two weeks this week isn't it, it is yeah so autumn watch is extended for a whole two week period which is going to be really really exciting exciting so we'll be there for a little bit longer for autumn watch yeah it's gonna be good okay. some good stories and some good stuff i have to say it's gonna be fun let's do the old quiz then let's do the old quiz well you know every uh week we give you a sound or an animal and we ask you to guess what species it is so let's have a little look at today's quiz <laughs> Hmm. What about that? Yeah. You see that? I remember in 1984. Back in your day. When I was a When lad, I were a kid. When I was a lad. When I was young. When I was a lad, 1984, <laughs> going all the way to the Western Isles of Scotland to hear that sound. Did you? There's, yes, there's a clue there. Hmm. It's, I mean, you know, that is a remarkable, remarkable sound. Yeah, it's pretty So cool. it is a, well, I was about to say it was a UK species. It is at some points in its life, a UK mm -hmm. species. And uh, we've got more of that uh, coming up towards the end of our broadcast this morning, which isn't live. We've got to be honest about this. No, we're not live We're, right we're now. recording this. Yeah, we've, we've pre-recorded it. So you're seeing a, a, the recorded version. We recorded yeah. this a couple of days But we're not going to edit out the rubbish. No, we're not. The rubbish is sticking in. <laughs> You've got to stick with us for all the rants. 
<laughs> and all the, yeah. you know, whatever we do, I don't know. Let, let's just immediately move to something that's never rubbish. Yes. Uh, Lindsay Chapman is joining us this morning. She's been looking at the material you've been sending into us. Lindsay, good morning. Good How morning. are you? Yes, I am also inside this morning because it is hurling it down here in the northwest of England. Um, but actually quite exciting. I'm doing a bit of bird watching out my window as you're chatting there. Question for you both, though. As you just mentioned, we are going to take a little hiatus for a while, but it has been fantastic, as always, to have a look through the group again this week and just see the amount of content that's on there, actually, photographs, videos, all kinds of different comments coming in as well. But my question is, obviously, 2020 has been a really unusual year in many, many ways for, for everybody, basically. But I want to know, on a wildlife front, what unusual sightings have you seen? Mm, unusual sightings, mm. I think we said. Well, the goshawk flying into that, our house. Yeah, that was pretty special. That was highly unusual. Yeah. I, I never, when I were a lad, I mm. never dared dream that sort of thing uh, could possibly uh, have happened. And it was such mm. a joy to be able to put it back. Yeah. You've released it back. Yeah, into oh, the it was world. incredible. Absolutely amazing experience. But in the night jars as well. The night we jars. We had a night jar fly over our head. We, we were laying down in the field, weren't we? Yeah. And we had a, a stick with a white um, white kind of cloth tied to it. It was meant to look like the underwing of a night jar so that territorial males will come in and uh, have a look, investigate. So we were kind of like... That was, at the, that was at the peak of lockdown, wasn't yeah. it? It was really quiet and we could hear the night jar where yeah. normally it would have been too noisy. We have quite a major road near where we live, and and in the evenings in particular, if it's still, you can hear that road. It drown, yeah. drowns out the sound of everything else. But we could hear those night jars and went out looking for them. It was here. So, it was like flying above our head. You could feel it. It's like we, wing beats. We felt we felt the wing beat of yeah. a night jar's wing on our face one evening. Amazing. And I think that and the goshawk surely. Oh, and yeah. the white badgers. The white badgers were yeah. really cool. And I have to say, I I did go and have a look at a very unusual sighting up in Scotland, but uh. That's coming a little bit later, a couple of weeks' time in a, oh, in a broadcast. But. There you go. I love a trailer head. I love a trailer head. There's nothing better than that. Um, but really unusual sightings from you. And many people across the country as well have noticed things in the last seven months that they haven't necessarily seen where they are before, had new things in their garden, or just paid a bit more attention, which is really wonderful. I think wildlife has given us an awful lot in the last seven months or so. And um, I had a look through, basically. People got in touch to say what they had seen. I had a hedgehog in my garden, which I have never seen. I was very excited about that. And I found a curlew about a mile away from the M62. And that was a just an incredible moment for me. But Julie Treverthen, she got in touch and she'd been out on a lockdown walk and she saw this, she saw an orchid. And I thought that was a really stunning photo. So what a lovely thing to have noticed. Real stunner there. Uh, Colin Valentine, he tweeted and he'd spotted a dipper and I'm quite fascinated by dippers and I wanted to speak to you both about this because question, um, do they have completely feathered eyelids? I think they've got completely feathered eyelids. Is that to help them underwater? Well, they, they had, they, yes, eyelids come in, you know, two forms for birds. They come in conventional form, like we have our eyelids, which principally come down. Um, and, uh, but birds have a, a different type of eyelid um, called a nictating membrane. And the nictating membrane is a, an eyelid which starts at the front and then moves to the back. And, and if you look at birds of prey, for instance, or anything where there's a risk of damaging their eye during, uh, you know, an act of predation, should we call it, or dipping underwater, then you see this um, nictating membrane pull forward. Now, in the case of the dipper, when they use that, that membrane that's pulled across their eye, it is like a contact lens. It, it's not completely um, opaque. They, they need to be able to see through it. And if you watch really carefully when dippers are dipping, and you'll see that membrane pull forward just before they nip beneath the surface of the water. And it's there to protect the eye whilst they're beneath the surface of the water. But it isn't feathered because if it were feathered, the bird would be effectively blind underwater and not be able to see anything. It's, it just looks a little bit milky. And it, there must be an adaptation there which allows the bird to still continue to see well because they're hunting visually when they're down there. They're, they're, they're not feeling for their prey, all those things you can see in that bird's beak. They are actually looking for it. So it's like a sort of a, a toughened contact lens, but it's not it's not feathered. Otherwise, they, as I say, they, they wouldn't be able to see anything. And what colour did you say it was? Is it white? It's called a nictating membrane. And, and in fact, 
I can't think of any birds that don't have them, but you really see them prominently in species that are predatory um, because they are there to protect the, the eye. From a tooth or a scale or something, be the last thing you want to get in your eye if you're yeah. diving in or getting something. So, yeah. Well, that is very interesting. Thank you. So that question did come in from Connor. Liz Hawkins was in touch and um, Liz Hankins, actually, not Hawkins, Hankins. And she saw a stoat in her bird bath in Cornwall. Now, this was a little while ago. I think it was about a year ago. And they thought it was a weasel to begin with. But how do we know it's not a weasel? Well, it's got a black tip to its tail. Yeah, exactly. Isn't black. that a fantastic piece of footage? I love that. <laughs> It is. That's lovely, around, isn't it? Let's go. What a great thing to go and see in your bird bar. Yeah, that would have made yeah. our spring or summer. That would have been pretty good. Yeah. Stoat in the bird bath. Boom boom. 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 <laughs> <laughs> if that doesn't become a theme, I'll be very upset. Um, right. Let me move on to Gaynor Griffin. Now, great. Gaynor got in touch with a really lovely email. Actually, I found this very moving, and many of you have sort of mentioned over the last six, seven months that Self-Isolating Bird Club has offered you something during lockdown that maybe you weren't expecting. So access to wildlife, you know, new friends online as well. But um, Gaynor had a really difficult lockdown because her dad had always been a really active man. He'd done lots of walking in the woods, uh, obviously a very special individual, but he sadly died with COVID-19 on the 2nd of April. And around that time Gaynor discovered Self-Isolating Bird Club on Facebook and she began to watch the birds in her garden, she began to interact with the Facebook group and one evening her son who's called Joel, he's 13, he came downstairs and he told her there was a hedgehog in their garden and this was a major major moment. She wanted to tell her dad but obviously she couldn't so she said is it all right to name it Bernie after my dad, which is what they did. And then they watched it, and hopefully we can watch a bit of their footage as well, um, on wildlife cameras. And then one day, Bernie turned up with not one, not two, not three, but four, <laughs> four little hoglets. And they have watched this family grow with much, much joy and edited this selection of clips, really, together for us all to th see. And I just wanted to share it with you, really, um, this video is made by Gaynor Griffin, Joel Griffin as well, and it's dedicated to Bernard Fisher, who was her dad. Isn't this fantastic, you know, that, that wildlife can offer, in times that are very difficult, a little bit of respite and comfort? I think it's incredible. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely yeah. fantastic. What a great story. And look there, look, someone really close to the hedgehogs engaging with those animals oh one's got oh. stuck behind a radiator and oh, no, got all warm inside <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. it's that kind of engagement isn't it when you know when the animals do come in oh, 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 there it goes look oh but having them so close and everything just to have that engage it's escapism isn't it it just provides yeah. you with an outlet and yeah it's yeah I'm, I'm glad that that hedgehog family kind of was in your garden yeah, it's perfect. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Big, big shout out to Gaynor for sending that in. It is it is wonderful for us all to see that. And we said this uh, a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? That we we wouldn't see all these things that are happening across the whole of the country if you didn't send them in. And we've seen some fantastic stuff. So it's it's really ace that you're sharing it. And thank you very much indeed for sending that in. Hedgehogs are my absolute favourite, which you know. And they really can move at speed. Oh, they can move at speed. They're speedy little things. Absolutely. Let's have a look then at some of your best pictures that you've sent in. Obviously, this is my favourite part of the show because I get to reflect the incredible photographers that we have got in this community. So Darren Nichols was surprised to see this this uh, great egret flying over. I thought you'd like the symmetry on that, Chris. I like the symmetry. Mm -hmm. I like the way you can see through all of the feathers. Obviously, great white egrets are white birds, but here... Um, you know, Darren has turned it into a sort of a, a rusty coloured bird. No, no problem with that whatsoever. I think it is absolutely beautiful. And, it, and also, it's almost like an X-ray of the bird's wing, isn't it? It, it is. allows you to look through those large primary and secondary feathers, that are, which are obviously on the underside of the bird as it's flying at the moment, and then towards the, uh, the covert feathers on top. It's a stunning photo. I really like that, yeah. It's almost asymmetrical. The feet, you haven't quite got the feet right, but, um, you know, that, that but really... But you can't have everything. That's really niggling on my part. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah I love it. I love yeah. it. It's like a stained glass window. Yeah. 
Tara, you should be very pleased about the niggle. We love to find the niggle, or certainly Chris Packham does. Um, Francis Crickmore got in touch with a kingfisher in flight. And again, I sort of enjoy looking at these moments with wildlife. And that's a kingfisher in a shape that you don't normally see. You know, we tend to see the diving pictures, don't we, or the um, perched on a branch. But I thought that was really quite a nice photograph, you know, it's a, something a little bit different. The colours are stunning there. And then I picked one of my favourites. So loads and loads of you are posting pictures of birds of prey. They're wonderful. I look at loads of them. But one of my favourites is, it's got to be the barn owl. I love the barn owl. It's from Martin Orford. Ugh, look at that. It looks like a painting. Mm. It really no. does look like a painting. It's beautiful. Mm. I love the position of the wings of that, you know, of the of the owl there. And you know, I just see it with its legs outstretched as well. Often something we don't realise is how long these birds' legs are. And actually when they do tuck all their feathers in, it is quite they do look quite kind of alien looking. To to see, of course, the legs stretched out there is really kind of a different kind of perspective. And I quite like that. It's obviously about to grab something, it's got its eyes on something hasn't it yeah yes i mean again you're right if you were going to paint a barn owl that's a position you'd paint it in i mean in terms of its pose it's it's absolutely perfect isn't it mm. yeah it's, it's absolutely tail feather. Yeah, it's Is missing, it missing tail feather something's this... going on with the tail but as yeah, you don't get it's... me on barn owl's tails you know what i'm like with barn owl's yeah, tails you know i love a barn not owl. enough of them love barn owls <laughs> definitely not enough of them so there is a very very good one Points to you, Martin, really loved it. And then um, I emailed last night, I emailed Kate and Fabian really late on because I found this clip that came in from Paddy Wright. And I said, please, can we put this in? Have we got time to put this in? And they were both like, yeah, why not? Have a look at this. This looks like water moving, but it isn't. That's astonishing. <laughs> Absolutely astonishing. It's like a water current, isn't it? It is. Paddy, I think, has been to um, Snettisham on the North Norfolk coast, uh, where these red knot aggregate in vast numbers at this time of year. And uh, at a time when the tides are right, they get pushed off their high tide roosts because the tides are so high, there's no mud left out in the wash where they're roosting. And they literally flock in in their tens of thousands to uh, 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 some gravel pits, I suppose, um, just on the beach mm. and uh, yeah just listen to them it's not just about the visual it's about the sound really cool but you know what my favorite well <laughs> i really like the the uh, caption that um paddy has put with this he said we wondered whether to add this and then we thought why not I love a pun. Yeah. I'm so upset. I was just going to say, um, when I asked the producers, they're not going to say no, are they? But you beat me to it. Oh, sorry, Lindsay. <laughs> Don't worry. I was going to take it as my own, Megan. I was going to take it as my own. So it's better to be truthful. Much better to be truthful. I like it. <laughs> good. Good. good stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm going to finish with autumn because obviously we are heading into autumn, then we're heading into winter. Um, and sometimes, you know, I think people really look forward to the spring, don't they? They look forward to all the new life coming, but there is such a lot to look forward to. And one of our Facebook members, Mark Ishkaru, uh, got in touch and said to the group, I'd love to see your sunset pictures. What have you got for me? So he started the feed off and it's actually a really beautiful feed. So if you get a chance to go and have a quick look on Self Isolating Bird Club Facebook page, do head to this um, picture by Mark and click underneath because you'll see a long line of different sunsets. And we're just going to play a few of them for you now. They're from all over. One of them is from the US of A. But I think autumn is something to be celebrated. You know, those nights drawing in, there is real opportunity in terms of seeing wildlife, isn't there? There's lots of beauty in it, I think. The colours changing, but the different behaviours that you see, the different kind of dynamics of behavior and how they are interacting with their environment i think it's kind of a calmness to autumn isn't it where everything is kind of taking a rest taking a breather and i don't know it's just a nice clean crisp air. i love autumn yeah I like really autumn very much like it. I, I read once about why we're drawn to sunsets because people always photograph mm. sunsets they spend all day with their you know their phone or their camera in their pocket and then they see a sunset and they can't resist getting it out what's that all about we are mm. as a species drawn to sunsets and sunrises and one of the thoughts was that you know in days of old long before 
I were oh, a lad, no. long before. Um, you know, it was a success to have survived through another day. And if you'd lived to see the sun set, or indeed the following day's sun rise, then it would, it would, you know, make you feel exultant because survival was tough, you know, tens of thousands of years ago when we were struggling with other predators and, and all sorts of things which uh, are not issues for us in contemporary life. But that, you know, that was the thing. That was the, yeah. the thought of it. And it's another reason why we celebrated the change of seasons, because, you know, you celebrated spring because, frankly, you got through winter and getting through winter was really, really tough for our, uh, you know, ancestors. So maybe that there was some veracity in that. I'm not sure. But whatever, the beautiful colours, I think, appealed to stunning. most people as well. But there's some stunning photos in there. Yeah, really stunning photos in there. I used to live just near the East Coast and we used to get up early to go and see the sunrise up um across the sea beautiful and now i live on the west side so i can go and watch the sunset and i think there is important marking moments so it's very interesting to hear to hear why we're drawn to those sunsets it's been lovely to spend some time with you both again you know on this run of self-isolating bird club up until autumn watch and um, thank you to everyone at home for keeping in touch and sending us all your videos, your comments. I love watching the live feed as well. I know we're not live today, but all the funny comments that come in. Thank you for entertaining me. But I'm going to hand over to a friend of mine now, um, as I say goodbye for the moment. And it's Lizzie Guntrip. She's a friend of the show as well. And she obviously looks after the wildlife from my window hashtag. I've known Lizzie for a long time now. And she's made another film for us talking about tracking nature through the season. So just what we were mentioning there. And she's very much saying that, you know, winter is not just about waiting for spring. There are lots of uplifting and inspiring things to see in the autumn and winter time. So I'm going to say goodbye to you both for now. And I'm going to hand over to Lizzie. Hello, Chris and Megan. It's Lizzie Guntrip. Thank you for having me on your show a couple of months ago and to Ruth PC, Lindsay Chapman, Kate Crocker, and Fabian Harrison for making it possible. I also just wanted to say how amazing it was to see the messages on the live stream and on social media when SIBC featured wildlife from my window. I have so been enjoying watching the wild mornings with Chris, and I've also been loving seeing everyone's wildlife from my window posts on Twitter and Instagram. I think it just shows that whatever your circumstances and whether you live in a really urban environment, um, you can still connect to nature and there is still nature to see on your doorstep. I did just want to share um, one wildlife from my window story with you from Myra, who during the last few months has been using wildlife from my window at home between her hospital shifts as a scientist, including on the COVID intensive care wards. I just thought that that was a lovely thing that I wanted to share with everyone today. When we created Wildlife From My Window, we wanted it to be as accessible as possible. So we wanted it to work for people who were housebound because of their circumstances, as so many people are experiencing right now but we also wanted it to work especially for people with chronic illnesses for whom being housebound is a reality for years and sometimes decades. I wanted to share a few more suggestions about how you can connect to nature even if you are housebound but especially if you are struggling right now. So the first thing that I would encourage you to do is opening your windows during the day and opening your curtains at night. You don't have to do it every day, you don't have to do it for a long period of time, but as the days get colder, it's so important that we still feel connected to the light and life that is outside. As it gets dark, I would really encourage you to consider leaving one of your curtains open. One of my wildlife from my window friends found that it was really beneficial for them to have their curtains open in the evenings if you are stuck at home and feeling a bit cabin feverish, then opening the curtains might be a way for you to feel a bit less trapped. And of course, the wildlife that you'll see at night is completely different to the things that you'll get to see during the day. My third tip is to try and keep a nature journal. I have been so inspired over the past few years by some of the nature journal posts and blogs that I've seen on the wildlife from my window hashtag. Writing down the sights and sounds and things that you see 
is a great way to focus on something positive during this time. It's a fantastic way to track the seasons and also it's a really good way to focus your attention and look more closely at what you're seeing. The last thing that I wanted to mention today is to connect with others and to share your nature sightings. Nature can be hugely comforting and uplifting. It might not be able to cure me, just as it won't cure my friends with ME or with other chronic illnesses, but it can help uplift and inspire. And that is what I think is so brilliant about what you guys are doing with the Self-Isolating Bird Club. And also hopefully Wildlife From My Window can continue to inspire and connect people who are housebound, but who all love nature. Winter is not just about waiting for spring. There is beauty and wonder to be found out there, even when the trees are bare and the streets seem grey. And so I just wanted to sign off by reading one of the Wildlife From My Window stories that I have received. Wildlife From My Window, writes Jessica, gives us a positive way to celebrate how, by changing our perspectives, we can make some good of what on the face of it might be a sad and limiting situation. The more I looked, the more I realised just how rich the wildlife on my doorstep was. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Lizzie. That's fantastic. Some really good ideas there. If you are watching wildlife from your window, firstly, use that to mm. hashtag wildlife from my window, of course. It's enormously popular and it's easy to see why, because you can, if you you know feed it or if you live in an area <laughs> where you're able to... Sorry. <laughs> ...encourage wildlife. Um, um, you're able to uh, in, enjoy wildlife at close range. It's, I suppose one, the one proviso is to, to make sure that if you are feeding wildlife from your window, you're feeding it close enough to enjoy it, but not close enough so that there's any threat to the wildlife because it's associating yeah. you with the food, particularly if it's mammals such as foxes and badgers and hedgehogs and, and things like that. But yeah, it's yeah. a fantastic thing that Lizzie set up and you can obviously join yeah. in across the social media platforms, wildlife from my window. Thanks, yeah. Lizzie. I love searching through them because you often see some really cool stuff. I know, loads of fantastic fox yeah. footage. Yeah. People enjoying fox their footage. foxes in their in their gardens on their patio. Stoats in your bird bath. Yeah, stoats in the bird bath, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone gets that cultural point of reference, then <laughs> that really they'll, got be, me earlier. they'll be really, really, we'll be really pleased. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you do get where that's come from. We'll give you a clue. Comments. It's one of our favourite films, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, really, that, I really struggled films. to keep it together. And... <laughs> Well, you're going to struggle to keep it together now because it's soapbox time. It's soapbox time, and this is one which is just, I mean, absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? Absolutely. Oh, I mean, you know, like, it defies belief, really. I'm already struggling to find the word, so let's get started. Um, this week's soapbox is looking at a, I don't know, what would you call Amazon? One of the internet biggest sales internet sales sites. But well, hold on, we better not is. just pick on Amazon because it, it's eBay. It's eBay. It's, there's plenty of other sales platforms that do this. Yeah, it is. But we're kind of looking um, not, you know, at them as a whole. We're looking at some of the things that they sell openly and um, which are targeted at species which is illegal to persecute. However, some of these big retailers um, sell lethal animal traps these are traps which you can lay out in your garden your farm or whatever outside space you've got and um, there's ones which openly target red squirrels there's ones which target moles there's ones which target foxes there's loads of them anything you can imagine you've got rats you've got mice you know yeah. they're the common ones um, and and these traps do it in all different forms you know the sticky and some ones. of them really inhumanely really they're, they're, these bad. rodent sticky traps so oh. basically you put an enormously sticky sheet on the floor and if a rodent runs onto it, it gets stuck to it. Initially, it's feet, of course, then it's tail, then it's body. It's anything, moving yeah. around and then, and then really it just stays stuff. there. You know, it's not poisoned. It's not killed with a, a snap to the neck. It basically stays there until it dehydrates or starves to death. Yeah. And how on earth can anyone countenance doing that? I mean, it's bad enough. You know, we had, I mean, we won't get back to them mouse issues of the spring and summer but we were catching our mice alive and, re and releasing them we should say you can buy live rodent traps on these platforms yeah look well. at this one look at this one this is a bucket where you encourage the rats or the mice to come with food they fall into the bucket of water and then they're left to swim obviously absolutely exhausted until they drown 
it's look just, at that on just, Amazon. It's beyond belief, isn't it? You know, it? The, these big organisations, these big companies need to take responsibility for the items in which that they sell because this is totally, totally unacceptable. I mean, what in what world is that an ethical thing to be doing even, in 2020? Look, even if you can't live with mice, even if you can't, mm. if you can't manage these animals without killing them, which is really not a great testament mm. to, you know, our intelligence. You know, if you can't keep a mouse under control without killing it, if you can't remove it from your space or keep it out in the first place, you know, if you if you have to kill them, which we don't agree with, then at least you would do it in a humane way. You wouldn't let them drown in a bucket or get stuck onto a piece yeah. of pad so that they just starved yeah. or, or died of thirst. No, it's absolutely horrendous. And the, there's these mole traps as well, which are essentially like these big plastic tubes. And you can put them out and they say, you know, check them regularly. But the thing is, as soon as a mole goes in there, it's just trapped inside. And if it's a hot day, it's going to get really hot in that tube and that poor animal is going to die of, you know, heat exhaustion. Or if it's a really cold day, hypothermia, it could starve to death. I mean, that is an incredibly painful way to go, incredibly unethical, incredibly wrong, particularly in the hands of people who, you know, aren't, aren't ex experienced in these kind of things and just leave those tubes or leave you, the You've had a letter, haven't there. you, from a man who is a, a, mole, a professional mole catcher. We won't get into the <clears throat> into the dispute here because we're not talking about whether you should or, or shouldn't kill moles. We're talking about the fact that these methods yeah. are available to people who aren't qualified to use yeah. them. And he was very concerned. Yeah, he was very concerned. I got a really long letter from him and a DVD that he's put together because, you know, whilst he goes out and, and, and works with moles and taking them out of certain environments, these traps to him were just totally unacceptable because he sees it all the time. He sees that, you know, in, a, in an effort to remove moles before they get him in to deal with the situation, um, that people just put in these horrible tubes and he'll go and find... The, these tubes, uh, I've got a mole inside and it's been dead for ages, but who knows it was how long it was in there alive for. It's totally... And when you have pest control officers who are, you know, who are sufficiently concerned about the, the way that these traps are inhumane mm -hmm. and freely available cheaply on all yeah. of these sales platforms, then you know you're in trouble. You know it's bad. You know you're in trouble. Yeah. Don't you? that, that's, so something should be done. These companies should take responsibility for the things that they advertise. They should yeah. be held accountable for the fact that they're selling things which are illegal in some instances. Red squirrels. You can't persecute can't red squirrels. Red no. squirrels. What are they thinking? But look, look at, look at this. Look, at, know, look at this. Look, look. Got it up. It's got a red squirrel on the picture. No. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, it's just a no-brainer, isn't it? This shouldn't be allowed to happen. Amazon, eBay, whoever it is, if you're selling these kind of traps, sort it out. Well, and there's a petition Take too. responsibility. There, there is a there petition. petition. Get Amazon, UK yeah. and eBay to remove uh, inhumane and illegal use small mammal traps from their sale. And the uh, website is going to be on our platforms there that you can go to to sign that petition. And we will be signing that petition. Yeah. I hate the idea of killing these animals in the first place. And but you know, if people do it, they've got to do it humanely. Goodness Very me. Least. Yeah, I don't know. I suppose it's just a sign of the times, isn't it, really? We have trouble with social media companies. We have trouble with these big platforms. You know, they claim that they don't have the capacity to regulate what goes on there. My no. reply to that is well, don't have anything on there at all then until you can regulate it. You yeah. can't you can't, you know, plead ignorance and say, Oh, it's beyond our control. That's no, that's not it's acceptable. Not. It's not not when it comes to things like that. it's just no. No, no, no. Anyway, look, should we switch to something altogether more positive? <sighs> Let's. Yeah, Jack and his yes. dinosaurs. So Jack started off with an ankylosaurus as his uh, third favourite third dinosaur. Favorite, yeah. then second favourite last week. Triceratops. Triceratops. Great dinosaur, I like that one. So here is young dinophile, paleontologist <laughs> to be, Jack, telling us about his favourite dinosaur. So the T-Rex is my ultimate favourite first favorite dinosaur because it means the tyrant lizard king it was the king of the dinosaurs and it ate meat it lived in the cretaceous it it had its brain as size of a banana um a it had eyes that could see from one mile it could it could, it could smell extra ultimately. Um, 
It had a scaly back. Could balance with its tail. Its feet could have stomped the ground. And that's why I liked T Rex. He is a little legend. He is. That's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. He's a little legend. Stomping his T-Rex. Ah, oh, they're stompy T-Rexes. Yeah. Can you I imagine the sound of a T-Rex stomping? I mean, stomping, that was, I know. You'd feel you know, the vibrations. Well, they you? did. We think that they yeah. actually heard and used infrasound. Yeah, like elephants. Like elephants do to communicate with one another because scientists have um, scanned the brain cavities of T-Rex and they've also been able to look at their hearing, obviously within the, the skull space. Uh, there are you know, uh, chambers where the ear, internal parts of the ear were. And by scanning those and, and looking at them, we think that we could say that uh, T-Rex was able to hear and perhaps therefore communicate using infrasound. Cool. Infrasound. Anyway, look, Jack's got his T-Rex model there. I, yeah. That's a lovely model, I've got to say. Maybe it should have a few feathers, Jack. Um, you know, because we now think that at least mm -hmm. some of the Tyrannosaur species were feathered, not in a sort of a feathery chicken bird sense, but with sort they of... They quite colourful. I kind of the top of the head. Can you imagine they? colourful feathers there? No, think sort of orange, more, wasn't it? Orange is more like suggested. Spines, yeah. Well, people come up with a whole range of yeah. ideas for, for colours. Um, but anyway, I've got my own T-Rex model. It's going to make Jack very envious. It's going to make a lot of people envious, I think. But here's, look, here's me with my T-Rex. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is Jack in about 50 years' time. He's going to... <laughs> But he's not going to just have the head. He's going to have the whole body yeah, too. Yeah, probably is. And probably it's going to be covered in the right mm. feathers. And I've got a T Rex, Jack, that lives in my garage, and there you can see me with that that yeah. that T Rex. It's quite got. difficult because you have to shuffle past that head every time to get to the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, dear. yeah, yeah. It, it is my ambition to finally sort of mm. live somewhere where I've got a, a wall big enough to put the life size T Rex head on. Uh, but it is one yeah. of my prized mm. possessions. I might Jack. leave it to Jack in my in my will. He's a lot younger than me. Yeah. He's going to outlive me by many many years. Maybe I'll find out where he is and leave him. My you don't want it, do you? What are you going to do with that? No, I don't. No, I don't. I'd rather Jack had it because it's, it's his favourite dinosaur. I feel more of a velociraptor kind of Yeah, well, that would, be, that would be much smaller and easier yeah, to live with, wouldn't true, it, to be quite honest true. with you? Hey, do you know what? Another thing we've got to brag about. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. We're coming to you from renewable energy. We are. We're entirely solar powered. Yeah. Yeah. Fabian. Is, is 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 our producer brains yeah. behind the outfit of course big, yeah yep and yeah, has had solar panels fitted at his house yeah. on the roof so we are currently power you know powering out here using entirely clean energy even yeah. even on mucky grey days we are carbon neutral <laughs> I don't know about we, that. carbon well we need we need well, we're on we're on ecotricity here, yeah. so we are using Cheap. sustainable energy because yeah. we subscribe to them and if Fabian's on solar. Electricity too, so yeah, we're yeah. pretty, we're pretty, we're doing pretty well. We're pretty well. We're close to carbon neutral. Yeah, we, is... we can work a bit more at it to get to carbon neutral. But you know, we're pretty, we're pretty. It's pretty good, pretty, isn't it? Really, in terms of the production side of it. Yeah. Anyway, listen, we're running out of time. We anyway, better get on with the quiz. We're rambling. Yes, better get on with the quiz. So earlier on, we gave you this sound and asked you to guess who might have made it. Let's have a listen again. <laughs> Yeah, mm. it's fantastic sound, fantastic sound. Can be a very frustrating sound. It is, yeah. of course, the call of the corn crake, crex, crex, um, the scientific yeah. name of that bird. Uh, a species that was once all over the UK, living in our meadows, uh, but changes in agricultural practices, particularly since the uh, Second World War, meant that it got pushed to the northwest. And mm. in the 1980s, when I'm a lad, um, I went uh, up to those islands. And if you get there too late in the year, you don't get to see these uh, pictures as provided by Corn Crate Girl. She gets some cracking oh. pictures, honestly. She gets all the Corn Crate Girl. Oh, great, honestly, follow Corn Crate Girl on Instagram if you want to see some cracking pictures like this of these, these wonderful birds. Anyway, they produce the call from dense vegetation. And you can be really close to them, but you can't see the bird. You need to go in yeah. May. 
um, I would say, before the, the nettles and the irises get up and then they're calling and you can still see them. After that, there's too much veg. Yeah, you can see the heads poking up the top then, can't you? Yeah, that's about it. That's about it. So mm. call of the corn crake, uh, a species that's much declined, but there have been a number of conservation efforts in recent times to try and conserve the birds. Firstly, the RSPB worked um, very well with crofters in the Western Isles, mm. the farming fraternity there, to change the way uh, that they cut their fields and when they cut their fields uh, to allow the corn crakes to to prosper, basically not have their nests mown in the summer. That worked and the numbers went up and up and up yep. and the corn crakes started to spread. But it was always going to be fragile if you only had these animals in one part of the UK. So a couple of reintroduction schemes were, were, were trialled. Uh, one, again, RSPB, probably lead partner, as I recall, on the, the Neen washes in East Anglia. But Pensthorpe, in North Norfolk have been breeding uh, corn crakes yeah. themselves for a number of years now and releasing them into the Wensum Valley again in, in Norfolk. And uh, Nick Aitchison is here now to give us a bit of an update on how this release programme has gone to date and also to tell us about how it's been going this year as well. Over to Nick. Chrissy, Kat's about to release the very last corn crake of 500 that you've released here in the Upper Wensum. Over the last five years, what have been the real highs for you of this extraordinary project? Well, obviously hearing the birds returning is really interesting and, and, and that's the you know, secret to the success is getting them to come back. But it's been really encouraging working with the uh, local landowners in the Wensum and the engagement and the buy-in from them, actually the land managers you know, wanting to do something for conservation. And it really is land management that's going to be the key to the survival of the corn crate. We've lost them from the English landscape because we've changed the way we farm and we need, we need wilder habitats in order for them to thrive. Yeah, yeah, good grassland, insect rich grassland, that, you know, not just corn crake, but many species really rely on. And as always, in the case of turtle doves in the Norfolk landscape, corn crakes, it's about working with the people who own the land and who manage the land. Yeah. And they know their land well and they know what's possible. And it, it, it is those partnerships really that are the key to the success of any future project. And talking of success, this year has been quite remarkable in terms, despite lockdown, despite coronavirus, this year has been your best year ever for birds coming back to sing in Norfolk. Yeah, we've had, we've had 14 birds to come back to Norfolk, but the, the difficulty is, uh, Nick, is that you know we were hoping they were going to come back to where, where we released them, which we've seen at uh, releases at the mean washes and in car, you know, the wild birds in coal obviously come, come back, but we have seen a wider dispersal of the birds, which makes it very difficult for us to continue the engagement to get the land management right, because they're dispersing so widely. But fingers crossed with these last birds going into the wild to make their first migration to Africa, that we will have them coming back in increasing numbers to the Norfolk landscape. Congratulations to you and to everybody at Pencil, Pencil Conservation Trust for the work that you've done on this incredible project. Did you see what that? What a cutie. Oh, I love corn what crakes. A oh, I can't tell Love you. That. They're so like cheeky and they're just yeah. like bobbing around. Yeah. They look quite cool. Fantastic. And yeah. look, hats off to Pensthorpe. Mm. Small, independent body of people getting together to do something, obviously yeah. working with the right partners. Yeah. But nevertheless, I've got to say, the hard work's been done at Pensthorpe. Breeding these birds, understanding yeah. how to breed them in the first place, yeah. you know, making sure they've got the numbers, finding the sites, working with the farmers. And, and then and doing it, releasing those it. birds and the joy they must have felt when those birds started to come back must be unrivaled, mm. I've got to say. And if you want to see the whole film, because we've trimmed that one down a little bit for us, then you can do that by going to pensthorpe.com, pensthorpe with an E on the end, dot com. Links obviously yeah. will be available from us. You can watch the whole film there. And if, if, Great film. if you've really been good. fortunate enough to hear a corn crake in Norfolk this year or in recent years, and you know when it was and when it was because you kept a note of it, they'd love to hear from you. And 
and you can email them at crex, that's C-R-E-X, at pensthorpe.com, crex at pensthorpe.com. Let them know because they need to know where those birds are returning to yeah. so that they can work with the farmers there to look after them. Citizen Otherwise, they're, science um, is one of the most important tools in conservation, in modern contemporary conservation, and it's really yeah. important. So if you are hearing things, seeing things, um, that you think, oh, that's a bit different or unusual, and perhaps somebody would like to know about it, then make sure you look into it. So if you've heard corn crakes, get in touch with them. If you see something slightly different, I'm sure there's probably people out there who want to hear from you. Yep. So, um, yeah, have a little look. At Pensthorpe on, on Twitter. At yeah. Pensthorpe on Twitter, doing some really great conservation work. They're also working with turtle mm. doves as well. Yes. They have been for some time. Yeah. So, yeah, good good things. Right, birthdays. It's going to be tricky this week because we're pre-recorded, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, so if it is your birthday, wishing you all a very, very happy birthday. If it's your birthday when we're in Autumn Watch again, happy birthday. Uh, yeah, sorry that we can't do it live th um, today, but, you know, fingers crossed. I hope it's a sunny day for you. Um, based on the weather today, I... It, well, it's a bit miserable today, but I hope it brightens up. And oh, it will do. We get some lovely bright days in autumn, don't yeah, we? we? We really do. do. Right. Anyway, we're yeah. coming to an end, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, before we do, uh, there's been um, a, a debate raging yes. on the SIBC website about feeding ducks and swans bread. Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of views have been posted there. Um, I think the first thing to say is to be reasonable with your yeah. views, listen to other people's ideas, mm -hmm. get to the bottom of what we know to be best practice. Mm -hmm. Be kind to one another. Be kind. Remember, that's one of the rules. Be, yeah, be kind. kind to one another. Um, so some people, not necessarily on the SIBC platform, have been saying that if you feed the ducks and geese and uh, and swans bread, it kills them. And then other people have been saying, well, if you don't feed them that, they'll starve to death anyway. Um, I think what we would say mm -hmm. is that if you see someone feeding ducks and geese bread, you should firstly be pleased that they're engaging with the animals yeah. and they're trying to help them. So because as kids, we I fed yeah, them bread, you I fed did. them bread. My mum was always taking that, me down the park. And that was, you know, bread. that was that was brilliant um, because you got to see these animals up close and see their behaviour and learn about them. So as yeah. a child, that was invaluable. Um, so those kind of connections should be championed. They should be encouraged. However, you know, it's, it'd be great just to mention well you could use frozen peas or some grain instead that's the thing to do frozen peas yeah. are just the easiest thing so it's encouraging that and saying you know don't stop it all together I mean the birds aren't dying are they from not being no, fed they're not dying from not being no. fed I mean we know that when we feed birds even the birds we feed in our garden um, they still get 50% of their diet away from our bird feeders um, so they, and they switch very quickly to yeah. a fully wild diet if the bird food runs out so if your bird feeder runs out for a couple of days or a week, um, those birds don't all starve. They switch to either your neighbour's feeder, of course, yeah. or they they switch to wild food. They're so, very adaptable. Exactly. Yeah. That's the first they make thing. use of the resources. But I think got. it's the approach. It's like you say, yeah. you, you go up, you say, great to see you're feeding the birds. Really good. Aren't they beautiful? What have you learned? Which is your favourite? Um, did you know that, in fact, it might be better to feed them frozen peas? Yeah. Or grain, of course, if you can get hold of some some grain, mm -hmm. um, then that's particularly good for geese, yeah. geese and swans, ducks as well, of course. So it's, it's a means of engaging, and we're just trying to move people in the right direction the whole mm -hmm. time. It goes back to the disputes that there were in the summer about road verges, where people were planting, mm -hmm. you know, annuals and non-native species. Yeah. You know, those councils that are making an effort, you congratulate them and then suggest that they try something a little bit different that might be a little bit yeah. better. You don't slag them off for doing something yeah, when, them they, when they're then trying. That's all engagement. You know, it's just counterproductive, isn't it? Yeah. And anyway, look, stay cool um, and, and push people for mm. frozen peas. Frozen peas, grains. And grain, which yeah. would be good. Now, moving on to a stinky, stinky world. Now, if you remember last week, I said that we were going to talk a little bit about something kind of on the cosmetic side of things. Mm. And um, you might be raising your eyebrow thinking, oh, what's that got to do with wildlife? What's mm. that got to it's got do with it? a lot to do with it, actually. It's got absolutely so much mm. to do with it um so simon constantine i have to say he must have the most amazing nose it looks because, it looks really conventional he, because, i've met him many times he's yeah. got a very conventional nose it looks like mine and yours <laughs> it does it looks like an ordinary nose but there's something <laughs> extraordinary about yeah, going it. on inside it going on inside it yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so. because he comes up with the most incredible perfume so simon works for and fragrance it's a new kind of company that's been set up um, and they make ethical, sustainable perfumes. At the moment, I think they've got six available. Um, and I'm just going to read you a little bit on the inside of this, and then I'm going to read you a story about one of them. So the world's falling apart. At least that's how it feels right. In short, it stinks, and a lot of it is our fault. But it may not be over just yet. 
Okay, it may feel hopeless, but there's more than just a sputter of life in our beautiful planet left. Oh yes, we can still make the choices to help. Take actions to heal and do stuff to make a difference. Let's be honest, and ain't it going to change the world or save it on its own? It's just perfume. But we can make a stand. Change the way we think, challenge the norm of a bloated four billion dollars a billion dollars fragrance industry. And you know what? Maybe, just maybe, we can actually do some good and help rebalance the relationship between humankind and the natural world at the same time, which is a hell of a lot more than most are doing. And bridges the gap between the old world and the new world, not just because we use ancient and reverted ingredients, but by actively addressing social justice by standing in solidarity with indigenous communities and those protecting precious ecosystems, by doing our bit to rectify climate breakdown and the preservation of the natural world, our world, and by sticking our middle finger up at the big guys, oops, uh, <laughs> the cable of uh, rapid fashion houses and their indulgent luxury markets, taking it all and giving little in return. So essentially what it's doing is supporting indigenous communities, using yeah. ingredients from those areas that is going to support biodiversity, support natural ecosystem services, um, and also create beautiful smells so that the world is less So picky. if, if uh, what, what we're saying here and what yeah. Simon is, is saying is that if you use perfumes, uh, cosmetic perfumes, and, and many people do, of course, you can choose to use this range of perfumes because they will go to support those indigenous peoples. And here's the killer fact. The killer fact is that nine 90% of the world's remaining biodiversity, 90% of it, is in the hands of indigenous peoples around the world. It's not in the hands of the great, you know, uh, ENGOs. Mm -hmm. It's not in the hands of the world's governments. The people responsible for looking after that biodiversity are indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And yet they get hardly any money in terms of conservation funding. Nothing. Virtually nothing. And yet they're the people that are there living sometimes harmoniously with that wildlife yeah. and in charge of looking after it. And these perfumes source materials from those indigenous communities, yeah. giving them a livelihood so that they can continue to um, live in those uh, environments where they are in a sustainable way and also put money back into those communities through paying for those uh, for paying for those things yeah. uh, those uh, ingredients as it were because where we choose to buy things how we choose to consume yeah. makes a difference right. when we go in and you know purchase things um you know it really shows you know our pounds have power um, and by putting the power back into the hands of indigenous this one's oh, that's called, good that's called sand. Well, I like I like that I'll one. Tell you what, that is good. I've I've just sprayed one called Bean. I love the the kind of the um With these little testers, yeah. The side, the kind of the design of it. It's really smart. So this uh, this one Bean here actually has a story to go with it. And this mm. is a an email I got from Simon. I'm just going to read it out. One of their highlights is Bean. We source Tonka, an Amazonian nut, from the Kaipo lands in eastern Amazon. The famous Kaipo leader, uh, Chief Rioni of the Rioni Inst, has been put forward as a contender for the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in preserving the Amazon rainforest. At the same time, many of his communities have been affected by the coronavirus, with several elders dying sadly from COVID-19. This is in tandem with the illegal deforestation and wildf uh, wildfires um, of their decimated tribal lands, a result of President Bolasano's uh, push to exploit what's left of the Amazon. So, you know, these communities are having such a S difficult time with a leader time. that wants to cut down the entire rainforest. Grow soy. Grow soy. <clears throat> farm cattle. Deforest, farm cattle, everything. These communities are struggling. Um, and, you know, because, as you say, they they protect so much of biodiversity, these ecosystems, which we are all reliant upon. You know, the Amazon might seem far away, but it produces all of that oxygen. It stores all that carbon. It regulates all the world's kind of um, environmental fluctuations and processes and systems. It's important to each and every single one of us, too. So whilst we're not in the Amazon, it is still equally important here. Uh, and you can support these communities that are trying to make a difference by supporting the companies that support them. Smell that. Um, this is mad. Oh, I do like that one. I quite it's like mad. I'm yeah, going to try one quite, more. My, my nose is pretty saturated now, but I'm yeah, going to try. What's better? Okay, I'm going to try this one. This one's called Frank. Yeah. Well, Frank's really sherbetty. Oh, well, I think you like this one. Oh, I like that. It's really sweet and sherbetty. Like Go on, one more. This is, one. This, is um, this is Bear. Right. 
Yeah, well, I think my nose is a bit burned out. Yeah, I quite like sand, I think. I think sand was more probably I quite my, like sand. my favourite. Anyway, look, you should check anyway. these out if you're in the perfume market. Yeah. Christmas is coming up. You want to do something to help those indigenous peoples across the world yeah. um, remain uh, living harmoniously wherever they can. Yeah. With that 90% of the world's biodiversity, then you should be thinking about mm. shopping and perfume. Yeah, and perfume. addressing social justice and environmental justice too. So, andperfume.com. Unstink the world. I like that. Unstink the world. Unstink the world it is a bit smelly right now well, i don't think our kitchens ever smelled so good to be it hasn't. honest with you it really hasn't you know we've just had poo on the kitchen oh, it's this is much better there's nothing i can't i can't smell that poo at all now no 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 we've drenched up we've dosed ourselves we've in dosed beautiful ourselves up sustainable with, perfume we certainly have we certainly have anyway look as we mentioned before we're going to be taking a little bit of a hiatus um from our sibc broadcast yeah. autumn watch is coming up yeah so this is going to be the last broadcast for a little while we're not entirely sure when we'll be back but we will be back probably about four weeks i think we've got two weeks of autumn watch where we will be busy yes and then we've got preparation before that yeah. so i'm afraid for four weeks we we won't be broadcasting live. Yeah. However, you can sign up to our YouTube channel. There's plenty of old ones to watch. Oh, you can go back and create start from the beginning. And we'll be posting <laughs> clips, of course, on our Facebook, Twitter, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. website. So you yeah. can follow everything there. Continue to post yourselves. We'll be taking a look at those and interacting whenever we have the time. Yeah, we'll still to, be posting. So. We'll still be active. We'll still be doing what we do. Yeah. Um, and um, kind of helping and looking at the amazing community that you've formed so please do continue and to if you've got that. any ideas we still up for those yeah. Sub submissions at mm -hmm. sibird.club submissions at sibird.club yeah. yeah and remember as well we're going to be working on the calendar too so oh the if calendar you've got, if you've got any pictures that you'd like to submit you can send them in uh, to us as well and we will take a look and we'll sort through them all and it's going to be a fantastic calendar that represents all of the best of South by State and Cup over the last few months. Fantastic stuff. So that's it for the time being. We'll that's it. see you again relatively soon, we see hope. See you at Autumn Watch. And if later on, we'll be back for South by State and Club. Indeed, indeed. So until then, we'll leave you with our white-bellied seagulls in Australia. Goodbye. Bye.